Anil Gupta um, is a professor at the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, in India. And in the 80s, he founded Honeybee Network. Um, and he's a pioneer of social design in a very good way, um, stressing again and again and again that marginalized people doesn't, don't necessarily have marginalized minds. Quite the opposite is often the case. And um, so he built his honeybee network on this premise, um, like bees where cross-pollination happens from one um, field of knowledge to the other. And um, he's always, um, uh, basically, he's, he's enhancing and facilitating business on, on this, um, this cross-pollination level uh, in marginalized um, communities, if you want so. Um, so let me please introduce and uh, invite Anil Gupta, thank you very much for coming and joining us. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, friends. Uh, before I begin to talk about how design in the informal sector, which is so pervasive in Africa and in India, there's not much difference, actually. What Professor Mugendi mentioned, about 5% people in organized sector. In India, it's about 8%. So more than 90% in both the continents, our subcontinent people are actually in the informal sector. And if that is the rule, then why do we not build bridges between the formal and in the informal sector in a more vibrant manner? So the word develop, as you can see in the title, is slightly spelled differently because the word develop originated from the word envelope. Envelope is to cover, develop is to uncover. If a design has to really develop, then it must uncover, unfold the potential of people who we do not reckon as partners in design. How will we do that? So 25 years ago, when we started the Honeybee Network, a seesaw was discovered. And I would like to show you that seesaw. So on the cover page, you have a game of chess on the left on my, of the magazine. And on the right is snake and ladder. The chess is a game of strategy. The snake and ladder is a game of serendipity the uncertainty. And the seesaw of strategy and uncertainty is what identifies or characterizes the life of an innovator all the time. It may fail, it may succeed. People may like it, people may not like it. But if the innovator was concerned too much with certainty, too much with strategy, too much with success, the design, the spirit of the design will be lost. There'll be no freedom, there'll be no spontaneity, there'll be no authenticity. So it is very important that we understand how creative people in developing societies, in India particularly, court uncertainty. They just don't deal with it, they court it. And how do they do that is what we will see. So essentially, as you can see here, a nameless, faceless person comes in contact with the network, gets an identity. And this identity is very cr critical, very crucial, because many of them, many of the innovators, don't see themselves as innovators, as designers, as problem solvers. They just see their life a struggle, continuous struggle. And in the process of struggling, some solutions have been discovered. So let me give you an example. I, we walk every six months as a part of Shodh Yatra. Shodh means to explore Yatra's journey. So we have walked about 5,000 kilometers in the last 18 years. Every summer, every winter, we walk from village to village, learning from people. So one of the, in one of the walks in desert of Kutch, Gujarat, we met a shepherd. Shepherd had about 200 sheep. So I waved, waved my hand and I said, please, can you stop for a while? I want to talk to you. It was very hot. We were tired. We thought, let's have a little fun at his cost. So I asked a question which I thought was a smart question. If one of the sheep, in your herd gets mixed with the herd of someone else, how will you locate? How will you identify? I had a paper in my hand which had program of the Shodhi Yatra, so I was rolling it like this, 
He said, give me this piece of paper. So I gave him the piece of paper. He looked at it, and he said, to me, all the letters look alike. To me, all the sheep looked alike. I was illiterate in his language. He was illiterate in my language, and I was taking, making fun of him. The language through which people talk may not have letters, may not have a grammar of the kind that we really know, but it has a language, as Professor Mugundi mentioned. And how do we tap that language? So when we walk, we meet four teachers. Teachers, teacher within. The first teacher is within. The second teacher is among the peers. Third teacher is in nature. And fourth teacher is among common people. The people who have not gone to the school or the college of the kind that you go to, and yet have really learned in the laboratories of life. And I'll share with you some examples of how do they do that. So let me share another example of my naivety. Uh, there was a photographer with me who had gone to make a film of a herbalist, Karim Bhai, in North Gujarat, on the fringe of a forest. So the photographer was focusing on the herbalist, and he said, uh, please sit on that rock. And then he plucked a small twig of a plant growing on the roadside, plentiful, and asked him to hold it. The herbal healer got annoyed. He was upset. And I couldn't figure out why was he upset. So I said, what happened? He said, did we need this twig, this small branch of the plant? I said, well, it might look nice to the photographer to talk to you about plants and healings and so on. And therefore, uh, and then I added to my statement and I said, but there are so many of these plants around the roadside. So what if I plugged a small branch? He said, what did you say, so many? In nature, there is never anything too many. Every single plant has its own place. Every single fly, every single butterfly, every single ant has its own place. I used to pluck the leaves of the shrubs when I, was, I will be standing beside them. When I'm sitting in a lawn, I'll pluck a blade of grass, put it in my mouth. You know, those casual habits. Now, whenever I try to pluck a leaf without a purpose, Karim Bhai's image comes in front of me. Do you need it? And this non utilitarian perspective about nature, that you can't just take away anything that you wish from the nature because it serves your purpose, unless you can't live without it. So there are, there are philosophies embedded in everyday life which we need to learn from. Let me give an example how design delivers. So two brothers, Mehta Hussain and Mushtaq Ahmed, from Assam, northeast, had a small paddy field to irrigate. And they, had a, they, they used a windmill to run a hand pump to pump water to irrigate it. Small paddy field, half an acre. So they used this windmill. They asked two questions, and we brought it to Gujarat to make salt. In the salt pan, people have to pump the brine water near the coastal area and then dry the water to make salt that all of us eat, table salt. So there were two questions that these brothers asked, which we, the trained engineers and designers, would not ask. The first question they asked, does it matter whether the paddy field is irrigated in four hours or 40 hours? The second question they asked, because it's a hand pump, hand pump has a single wall, so water will come in a spurt, will not come smoothly. Does it matter whether water is given to the crop in erratic movement in a spurt or smoothly? The answer to both the question was no. In fact, plants would love to have slow irrigation, not fast irrigation. Plants need moisture, not water. You see? Why do we need a lot of energy to pump water in four hours and then let it drain all the nutrients of the soil, all the leaching that takes place? So slow irrigation is not only frugal, but more sustainable. It does not let the nutrients drain. And therefore, plant can get more moisture and more nutrition. Similarly, smoother flow is no better than the regular flow in this case. And there are two heuristics born. 
two new principles are born which we may ignore while designing products and services. First, maximizing output per unit of time is not always good. We are all taught, maximize, maximize output per unit of time. That is the, that is the measure of efficiency. Here, we just learned maximizing irrigation per unit of time was actually less useful, less productive, less efficient. So there are cases where maximizing output per unit of time may not be good. Drip irrigation, for instance. Smoother flow is not always better than irregular flow. You can use these heuristics in chemical plant, in manufacturing sector, in large number of areas, you can use them wherever it is required. The point is that from the innovations that common people make, we don't have to learn only the artifactual meaning. There are four levels at which we can learn from the innovation. Artifactual, metaphorical, heuristic, and gestalt. Four levels of abstraction. Higher the level of abstraction, greater is the replication. You can learn this lesson and use it in Europe without any difficulty. Without any difficulty. You may not like to use that windmill. Of course, that windmill did not have a gearbox. That was the innovation there. That is why the cost was low, 70 euros. That's all the cost was of bamboo windmill, 70 euros, 70 euro. That was the cost of the windmill. Frugal innovation was born out of a very efficient design principle, not by hook and crook, not by just makeshift. That's why I don't like the term Jugard very much because that only indicates to a temporary solution, a makeshift solution. We are talking about systematic solutions, solutions that have a theory underlying them. Theory, theory, design principles are underlying them, from which anybody in the world can learn. The analogic meaning is metaphorical. If you can use less of a resource and get more out of it, more out of less for more, MLM, that becomes a frugal, a principle of frugality. Heuristics are the thumb rules, and let me see how they just all work. So let me give you some examples of heuristics. We were walking in West Bengal and came across these beautiful terracotta horses lying under a tree. So we asked the potters, why did you keep such beautiful terracotta horses under a tree? Somebody can take it, somebody can break it. Then they answered the question. And they said, you didn't follow the logic of what we did. I said, of course, I didn't follow. That's what I'm asking. He said, no, 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 professor, you don't realize. We have not kept the most beautiful horses here. We have kept the best ones. Why did you keep the best one? So that when our children walk by this street, they know what the current standard of the best is. They must do better. Open source standards of excellence. Any society, anywhere in the world, in Italy, in Germany, in France, anywhere you can follow this principle. Let the younger generation know what the current standard of the best we have done. They must do better. They must do better. That's the way young people have to be challenged. What a great idea. In a village, a community of potters making urban clay pots is developing this design principle. I don't know if some of you have heard or seen a bridge made of tree roots. It is in Meghalaya, northeast. We walked over it in one of the walks, double-decker bridge. You pull the roots of the trees from two sides of the river. Why would a society, a community, a village community build such a bridge? And before they would even think of it, a question must arise. We don't want to do what everybody has done. We don't want to make a bridge of rope. We don't want to make a wooden bridge. We don't want to make an iron bridge. We have to make a bridge which is sustainable and where the entropy is nearly zero, if not zero. In this, there is nothing which is going to be waste. So first culprit here is culture. A culture which created the question which triggered the curiosity, we need to do something different, something sustainable, something that doesn't produce waste, something that follows the principle of circularity, circular economy. But then, after the question has been asked, you need technology. How to make it? 
how to pull the bridges, how, how to pull the roots, how to tie them up. And imagine for a minute that you now discover the technology, somebody in the community knows it, you still need institutions, the collective action, the group action, individuals can't do this. So the gestalt of an eco innovation ecosystem is pivoted on three principles of sustainability. If technology is like word, institutions are like grammar, and culture is like thesaurus. We need all the three for sustainable ecosystem. It would not have been possible to build this bridge only by knowing the technology, only by having group action, if in the first place the culture didn't exist, which would create a search for a solution that is sustainable. If you want sustainable design, if we want humane design, then we have to create a culture of asking those questions, as you have been doing in this seminar very well. In every panel, panel was asked repeatedly, how do you, what are the building blocks of a humane design which is collaborative, which is distributed, which is sustainable, which doesn't produce waste at the end of the day? So look at this, how humane designs evolve. So there was a single hand pump at lunch break. Children have to drink water at the primary school. 60 children, one hand pump. How will they drink the water? So now they have developed a very simple public art, public design solution. There are six taps. Six kids can drink water, one can pump. Collaboration required, turn by turn, everybody can drink. Very little cost, about five euros. That's all is the cost of this solution. Very efficient, very quick, very optimal. It's not a makeshift solution. But it increases the supply at a cost of five euros. So design that fosters the diversity and also nourishes the culture, how does that take place? So, you know, this is an example in many houses in eastern India, in Jharkhand, this is particularly taken from Jharkhand and also in West Bengal, people hang the pictures for the birds to come and stay there if they wish to. And of course, they collect the manure below, because manure is very rich. It can be put to the farm. So they feed the birds. What do we do? In my campus, we put spikes and when birds are adjusted to the spike, you put a board there so that birds don't come there. There's a culture which invites the bird. There's a culture which keeps the birds away. Every day in the morning at lunchtime, I feed the birds. The first bread that is cooked in our home is given to the birds, squirrels, ants. That's a custom we have. Makes sense. And yet the modern architecture doesn't permit that. The modern buildings are not allowed to, will not allow birds to come in, because they are nuisance. How can we create a culture which will create a space for birds, squirrels, ants, in anything that we design, every, anywhere we design, so that our future generation wouldn't say, what kind of design principles you had in which there was no place for nature? So therefore, we must remember that the principle of design is to have multiple life cycles, multiple life cycles. That is what a circular economy implies. We have so many innovations which use secondhand parts. I was very happy when one of the panelists mentioned that if a sofa has to be redesigned, you create a new upholstery, you make new features, new comfort levels, whatever you want to do. In our country, large number of innovations have evolved because second-hand components are used for finding new purposes. So let's look at how art and culture have been fostered. And I'm now going to take an example from a slum in South Africa, near Pretoria. I went there. This is a, there's a big mall, Woodland Mall. So outside of Woodland Mall, there was a slum called as Woodland Plastic Slum. Plastic because it's used to collect a lot of waste plastics from nearby and used to make a lot of things out of them. So there were entrepreneurs who were charging mobile phones for five friends. There were people who were shaving heads. And then this was an artist, Jonas Jacob Mabina. I don't know what you will call him. You will call him slum dweller. 
you will call him a garbage collector, but you will not call him an artist. He's not an artist because he doesn't have a nameplate, doesn't have a visiting card, doesn't have an opportunity to display his work at Museum of Art here, but he's an artist. Look at the design that he has made by using stones on the roadside. And these designs could compete with any design anywhere. So what does Honeybee Network do? Honeybee Network has to give identity to such people. And all of us, all of you can be a honeybee. You can join this movement to create space, to expand the space for the subaltern artist, for subaltern creative people, subaltern innovators who are struggling. And thank God that they didn't hear about Maslow. If they had heard about Maslow, they will say, no, 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 let me first meet my basic needs. And then second order needs, and then third order needs. Only then I can think of enlightenment. There couldn't be a more inappropriate theory ever evolved in social sciences than Maslowian theory of hierarchy of needs. Absolutely incorrect. It wouldn't give any agency to an economically poor person to aim at higher than life goals, which is what this person is pursuing. Look at this. You, these are migrant workers. At one time, they might have had small farms, drought came, they migrated. You can take a worker away from the farm. You can't take farm away from the worker. Look at this, a small garden beside his hut and beautiful design by the beer bottles. Looks nice. This is the house of Mabina, the artist that I showed. These are people who have aesthetics embedded in their everyday life. We don't have to teach them. It is there. And it makes survival easier. It makes struggle bearable. It makes the pain bearable, and therefore you can pull on with the life. There are artists who paint the whole history of the region in this art. This is from uh, North Gujarat, Gujarat Panch Mahal district. Whole range of events in the history have been narrated. Another beautiful artwork by a lady who otherwise you may call as unskilled, but actually has tremendous insights, Bhavi Mahato. So what do designs must, what is the key principle that design must serve? So this tree we saw in Himalayan region, this tree didn't realize that it was not supposed to branch, it by mistake branched. And I said, my God, what have I done? The tree asked itself, and then, said, all right, okay, I will make a correction, and it's made into a parallel stem. When I'm talking to you just now, many cells in my body are going through mutation. Thankfully, these are not cancerous in nature. Therefore, I'm talking to you. Why they are not cancerous? Because they are being healed by the autoimmune system of my body, like all of you. Our bodies, our nature has the capacity to repair small errors in the system. If designs that can repair themselves, that can improve themselves in the hand of the users in the journey of, from the fabrication to its consumption, they can, re, re, they can be reinvented, then I call that an autopoiesis model of design. It's an autopoiesis theory of design, where design that can self-govern, self evolve without an outside intervention by the very process of interface, interface, by the very process of interaction between products and people. Then they get, look at these designs. A motorcycle was converted into a plow. Now, nobody had realized that when in England, Enfield motorbike was designed, Royal Enfield, it will ever be used in India for plowing, but that's what farmers did. They can't afford a tractor, and they can't have bullocks because there's not enough fodder, so they designed this. Then this is for cotton field, this is for another area. Lot of variations, lot of variations. Self-improving designs, as the conditions exist in a region, design adapts to that. No centrally designed framework, not centrally designed architecture. As it evolves, in different regions, because of agroclimatic conditions, it adapts. 
That's the autophysis design. So let's ask ourselves a question. Who are the key actors whom we don't include in the design discussions? And on the key actor whom we don't include in the design are children. I'm a great believer the children are not the sink of our advice and sermons, do this, do that. They don't like it, actually. Children are the source of ideas. And let me give you some examples. Here is a girl, class eight. She saw her grandfather having a walker. My wife also uses a walker, Sadhana. Hey, she has a problem. But I, it, this thought never came to me that if the walker, with a walker, you have to climb the stairs, then the front legs should be adjustable so that when you climb up, they become shorter. When you climb down, they become taller. You don't have these walkers in Europe. Correct? You don't have these. But you need it. And these have been designed by a schoolgirl, class eight. Not by me, whose wife needed it, but who, with all the wisdom in the world, couldn't think of it. I'm demystifying the export power. I'm trying to mention, confess candidly, honestly, that though I had the problem in my home, the idea didn't strike me, despite the fact that I love my wife a great deal. But that love didn't trigger this innovation. This girl could suffer a little more than I did by the pain of her grandfather. We call them empathetic design. For want of a better word, in Sanskrit, there's a beautiful word, samvedana. Samvedana, some means equal. Vedna means pain. When I internalize somebody else's pain as intensely I feel it as that person feels it, it doesn't remain that person's pain, it becomes my pain. Then I try to solve my problem. I'm not solving somebody else's problem. That creativity which is born out of my internalizing the pain of others becomes an empathetic design. So let me go quickly. These are other models of design that have emerged. This is a very interesting refrigerator. All of you have refrigerators in your home, but it only gives you cold things. But you know, there's a refrigerator also produces heat. It has a compressor. Compressor produces heat. So this boy put a heat exchanger alongside the compressor. Now it gives you a hot chamber, hot water and hot chamber to keep the food warm. And because you have taken the heat away from the compressor, compressor works less, it consumes less electricity, lasts longer, so now you have a design of a refrigerator which consumes less electricity, gives you more output. It keeps things cool, it keeps things warm. Isn't it good design? That's the design that Europe needs, that's the design the whole world needs. But large corporations couldn't think of it because they don't care if that heat, little heat in the compressor goes waste. But a consumer, a small person, economically weak person cares about it. So therefore, frugal innovations from the third world can indeed inspire and instigate creativity anywhere in the world. And everybody needs them. Everybody needs them. This is an example from Gambia, how one can learn from common people how to use the flowers of palm and the lime to overcome the iron deficiency in the crop. Another example, how to keep the milk last longer without using refrigeration, without using chilling plants. Very simple, take some plants, names given, use their fumes to fumigate the container of the milk. No bacteria will grow in them for four hours, six hours for transportation of milk from one place to another without chiller, without chilling plant, affordable. God forbid, if we have energy problems in future and we have to still maintain a supply chain for milk for the children and others, we can follow this example. So the question now is, before I conclude, do we care about innovators only when they fall out of its place? No, I think we need to recognize that there's a huge scope for building horizontal stairs, bridge between hearts in the informal sector and the formal sector. The designers who design for corporations, who design for urban consumers, can also design for grassroots innovators. And we look forward to such partnership. The reason I've come here all the way is because I would like to involve all of you. We have 100, 200,000 design ideas and principles from various parts of the country. Just a small aside, I won't have time to explain it. You have two sides, inside out, inside in, inside in, outside in. 
large number of corporations have gone to the open innovation to bring outside in. Inside out is low, outside in is high. These are sponges. Take ideas, take ideas. Don't tell them what have we done with the ideas. You can also have both are low, like an ostrich behavior, or you can have inside out high, outside in low, like Tesla, which opened its patents. Toyota, which opened its electrical car patents. Didn't care about what they get from others. They shared with everybody because they wanted that industry to come up. And you can have both high, DB, DB. Dil bala, dimag bala. Big heart, big mind. Only those people can do that. They can share more with others. They can also learn from others. We need that kind of openness in the design community if we really want to go forward. Let me close by saying the real life, real journey of design is actually a balance between knowing, feeling, and doing. We know so much, we feel about this much, and we do only this much. Isn't it true? We need to change this. We need to act a little more. We need to feel a little more. Then the world becomes more beautiful. So creativity counts, knowledge matters, innovations transform, and incentives inspire, but not just material incentives, also non-material incentives, not just individual incentives, but also collective incentives. Thank you so much.